Hello and welcome back to the Johnny Lee Memorial League Base on Balls podcast. Here today, I am joined by Bracton, Hen, Paul, Connor, and Tita. I'm your host, John Height. I am back. Much to Cody's pleasure. No Taylor Swift for me this weekend. So back to regular scheduled programming. But a very busy week here at the league. Before we get into everything, first, I'll start with you, Bracton. How are you doing? Terrible. I'm on a five-week losing streak. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> Love the positivity. And how are you? Uh, you know, doing all right. A rough week. Team did well, but the team I played against just did slightly better. Did a little tinkering. Overall, it was a solid week. I had, I had some fun overall. I just wish I could have gotten that W. Paul, how are you? Fan freaking tastic. Uh, we'll get into why. But, yeah, this is the best I've felt about me in this league since I joined. Love to hear it. Connor, how are you? Uh, doing terrific on the surface. Had a good win this week, but not very happy about my team's outlook over the next couple. Good to hear. And lastly, my first podcast with Tita. Tita, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Just bounced back with a big dub over uh, Bracton this week, and we'll talk about it and have a good time. We are definitely going to have a great time. So let's get straight into the matchups here in week number nine. I want to start first with me versus Hen. Um, it was the highest scoring matchup of the week. Um, so Hartford Yard goes to took down the clear, Clearwater 756 to 718. So I now am staying undefeated. On the season, um, it was a very close matchup, a lot to break down. So, Hen, I'll, I'll let you go first before I talk. Um, just give me your thoughts about our week as a whole. You know, John Height. You know, it's weird. Uh, you know, every, the whole phrasing and the mantra of this league is pitching is king, and that usually is the case. But apparently, it wasn't this week. Uh, I outscored you pitching wise. A three eighty to three oh eight had a great star from Marcus Stroman. Max Scherzer finally did well. And, I mean, around the board, I think I got pretty good starts, excluding uh, one man who resides in Florida who shall not be named, uh, you know. <laughs> and David Bednar, 53 points uh, in relief, picked up four saves this week, which was pretty nice. Like I said, I wish I could have gotten the dub, but I think this week just came down. My bat just didn't come to play. I mean, Norman Carroll just continuing his rookie of the year pace, 66 points. But outside of him, a lot of the heavy hitters I've been relying upon – Jordan Alvarez, Juan Soto, Kyle Tucker, Bo Bichette, Max Muncy, J. Ram. All of them except Tucker scored under 30 points. And my second best bat this week was actually Jonah Heim. Shout out to Heim Hive. But, you no, know, 338 still a respectable amount of points for batting. But when you're you're playing against someone who almost had 450, it's kind of hard to win games. Well, would have beaten every other team this week, but I just didn't beat the person I was supposed to beat. <clears throat> yeah, so it was a it was a great game, Hen. I, I told you this individually, too. Uh, I mean, your pitching actually did outscore me, which was big. Um, again, I have a lot of pitching injuries, but your pitchers really showed up. Um, I definitely would have been a little disappointed if I had lost just slowly because of the Marcus Stroman start. Because, um, I mean, outside of, let's say he didn't throw the complete game shutout. I mean, I know it's, there's no what-ifs or whatever, but it kind of would have stunk just because my, my offense was pretty um, on fire this week. Otani at 77, Judd 63, Bet 77. Uh, a, a lot of guys were just pouring it on. There was that one day where I had like six players score like 20 plus points. Marcus Simeon is probably the second best hitter in baseball right now. But um, one thing I noticed from your team, uh, the pitching definitely has improved a lot since the last time I played you. So that's going to be a little bit scarier when we match up again later on. But yeah, I was very surprised to see guys like Jordan and Tucker. I was kind of scared to play against them. The only one that really became scared to really play against was, was Corbin Carroll, who's just unbelievable. Tired of David Bednar. I'm glad I don't have to play him anytime soon. He's a dog. But, yeah, great win. Um, I'm glad I could stay undefeated. I got I know Bracton next week and then my first matchup with Cody. So I'm pretty excited. But um, that does it for our matchup. But before we move on, does anyone else in the, the lobby want to chime in for anything from this matchup that any of you saw? So feel free to just speak ahead. Going once, going twice. All right, so it looks like that will do it for that matchup. Pretty self-explanatory. We broke it down, down pretty well. Let's head to Tita versus Bracton. So Tita remains red hot to start the season. He 
took down the Bismarck Large, 668 to 452. I want to hear from Mr. Happy himself. Bracton, tell me what you saw this week against Tita. Okay, so guys, we're going to throw some interesting stats out at you. You, the listener of this podcast, scored 32 more points than Bryce Miller did this week. And some three more points than Mike Soroka did this week. And 12 more points than Pierce Johnson did this week. So you guys... You should be feeling really good about yourselves. I probably should put you guys in my rotation, given I had 91 points for my pitching this week, the lowest in the league, even behind Chad, 94. So it's this is great. Uh, vibes are really, really happy about all this. It's, just, it's really, really great. Um, I, I, I'm i going to have a new segment on this show every week called The Menial Win of the Week for me, right? Which means I got—I mean, I got got something cool, but not actually a win. So, fifty-three points from Ezekiel Tovar. I'm happy about that. Fifty-one points from Andrew Vaughn. I'm happy about that. And uh, there was another guy I wanted to highlight. Uh, Forty points from Alex Verdugo. Yeah, my bats actually solid. Three sixty-one, good for I believe uh, six best in the league this week. But the pitching at ninety-one was the killer. So, uh, congrats to Tita. This game was over on Tuesday, so I'm I'm expecting to have a similar outcome when I play John Height this week, which we'll talk about later. But things are not looking good here for the short term. I I always keep saying the future's bright, but it's frustrating right now to watch this. It just makes me very upset. So go ahead, Tita. Yeah, Tita, you're up. Well, I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of sweating going on this week. I had a big early, big quick start on on my man Bracton, kind of just rode it on out to victory. My bats did not perform very well. Um, I, you know, I scored six sixty eight, which is maybe you know average, I guess. Um, but just my bats. Let me see again. I got to double check. And my bats scored. Uh, 317, and that was with a 30-point day-to-day from Gorber, uh, which helped. Um, you know, Bracton outscored my bats by 44 points, but, you know, getting a two-star week out of Eovaldi, getting 65 from him, who's just, I mean, he's basically, they really should just go ahead and give Eovaldi the Cy Young today. I mean, as good as he is for the sounds, um, you know, so. But I really liked, um, you know, Bracton had, you know, Ranger Suarez. He got 45 from, you know, minus 32 from Miller and minus three from Soroka. Plus, you know, Pierce Johnson was also one of the best players on my team with minus 12. Um, You know, it just could, you know, you get six points as well from Hunter Brown. That's one of his dudes. So you just can't really predict that. So, you know, all in all, it's a good win. And, um, getting ready to – my bat's got to wake up if I want to make a make a run in this thing. Definitely. Before I chime in, does anyone have anything else to say about this matchup? I think it's interesting uh, that Seattle Mariners ace uh, Bryce Miller. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to say on. that. And uh, the, the, the – yo, it's coming. Mm. The, king, the king of the comeback, Mike Soroka, with a negative three. Um, you know, Braxton saying a lot on the podcast last week that uh, it's certainly coming back to bite us. Yeah, that's the price I get for it. And, and I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I'll just throw out a nice little stat uh, I pulled out. So, obviously, we mentioned Marcus Stroman had that complete game shut up, but he also had another start uh, earlier today. So, if you took Marcus Stroman's two starts, uh, they exceeded Braxton's entire pitching total for the week. Uh, Stroman had 108 points, and what did Bracton have? What was it? 90 91. some from his pitching? I for 91. 91. So Marcus Stroman, Marcus Stroman outscored the entire Bismarck Larks rotation this week. Well, the only thing I was going to chime in, because I know we're playing this week, Bracton. I mean, I definitely think it's a, a positive to see 361 out of the bats. It's a good number. You did outscore Tita. Um, but in terms of the rotation, I mean, Hunter Brown is not going to do six in a week again. I'm sure. We'll score more than that this week. I hope so. Um, we talked about we talked about Suarez. Bryce Elder had 28. I'm sure he's going to have a, a good week as well this week. Um, it's just getting some of these other guys to really step up. I don't know what to even say about Mike Soroka, so I'm not going to say anything about Mike Soroka. But go win by Tita. I guess I, I'm coming to the conclusion I'm never getting Nathan Evaldi ever. 
um, because he's yeah he probably is the, the ring leader for AL Cy Young of the Year. Um, all right, so let's head to the next matchup um, that we're going to discuss on the pod. Let's do Connor versus Mel, another good boy ball. <laughs> I love when we put that in the chat. Connor, the Amarillo Sad Poodles won 508 to 411 over the Chihuahuas of El Paso. Connor, what do you have to say about your win? Yeah, so I think a lot of the same themes that my teams had over the weeks have uh, materialized in this one. My offense clearly outscored my pitching, which is something to correct, but 352 points out of my bats is a good sign. Um, I trade for Brandon Lau, who's kind of on a slow start to the year, but still gave me 15. Starling Marte with 42. I've been waiting for that since the start of the year. Uh, Whit Merrifield and Brand Drury also popping off. I'm hoping those players increase value so I can potentially uh, move them going forward. And then uh, Smell just had some unlucky starts. I think Coin and Ascraft might be a saying that uh, we'll stick in this lead. And uh, <laughs> So I think it's a good matchup, but there's definitely a lot of pitching-focused takeaways my team will need to do going forward. Definitely, and uh, anyone can chime in for this one. Anything that you guys want to break down from the Amarillo Sabatols victory? Continuing to pile it on a little bit myself, uh, I predicted on the podcast last week, I believe, that Smell was going to win and Alec Manoa was going to have a positive start. Alec Manoa did have a positive start. Zero is a positive number, but uh, Smell did not win. So that's my little analysis. But good good for Connor on getting a, a good win. Even without meeting the start minimum, he still got the win. So that's kind of impressive to me. So. Yeah, definitely interesting to see. Does anyone else have anything to say about this? If I not, think it's... I think it's interesting, Julio Tehran uh, for Smell. You know, Julio Tehran, former top prospect. You know, he's what, like 30, 31 year? I think 32, actually. Uh, maybe a bit of a reclamation if he can get something out of Julio Tehran down the line. Yeah, I remember someone said that in, the, I think, Maine at least once this week, something to look out for going forward. He has been uh, pretty dominant so far in the two times he's pitched. One thing I'll also say um, for this matchup for Connor's team, I remember a while ago I traded you J.D. Martinez just because I really didn't have room for him. And ever since then, my God, he's popped off. I think he's the third-ranked DH right now. He's got 14 homers, had a couple of 10-plus performances this week. Um, So that's someone that's definitely helping the offense of Amarillo. And for Smell, um, I know guys like Brian Reynolds were thrown around in uh, for what should we call it for for trade talks this week. But I mean, outside of that, uh, I mean, we talk about Ascraft. He's got to get some more out of Alec Manoa. I know everyone's crapping on Alec Manoa, uh, but got a huge start from Domingo Herman. Very good to see. I mean, for me as a Yankees fan, he had 31 against the Dodgers, so definitely a huge bright spot going forward. If he can keep that up, um, but yeah, good win by Connor. Let's head to the next matchup of the week. So we did... Let's go to Paul versus Bry. So Norfolk Tides took down the Rocky Mountain Vibes. 639 to 604. Paul, you have the floor. All right. So last week I predicted I was going to win. I was pretty bold in my prediction, and it came true. Um, and it came true because I took Bry's strategy of... You know, having four essentially open roster spots and exchanging them out every day for guys I thought would play or thought would pitch. And by doing that, I was at least able to cancel out some of what Brian was able to do with his streaming. Uh, Didn't work every time, but it didn't work for Brian every time. So, you know, I I don't want to say I've laid the blueprint on how to beat Brian, but... I think throwing his game at him is kind of the best way to do it. Um, You know, create a couple roster spots, put some guys on the injured list, whatever you got to do, and 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 roll with matchups. You know, make sure that your lineup is filled every day. Uh, Make sure that you have you know starting starting relief pitchers in your starting spots and relief pitchers in your relief spots. Um, That's that's my advice and. It worked out for me. You know, I had some help 
uh, today for my bats, some help yesterday for my bats. Uh, you know, a good week finally for my bats, 367 points. Um, the arms were there a little bit. You know, Kikuchi had a good day today. Uh, Senga had a good day earlier in the week, a 50-point start. Uh, Singer finally is getting back in form a little bit. Um, but overall, I liked I liked where I was at. You know, I like where I'm going a little bit now. I finally think I have an identity, which is just try and score as many points as my bat as I can and hope Senga or Kuchi or uh, Singer will come in and save the day a little bit for me for my arms. Definitely a good win by you, Paul. Does anyone else want to chime in about this matchup? Yeah, I noticed Bry actually yeah. had some some negative production from not only some relievers he streamed, but some starters too. Negative three from Reed Detmers. Uh, lower than average starts from Pablo Lopez, Jesus Lazardo, getting him six and eleven respectively, and then Lance Lynn coming back down to the like what the what the hell area of Lance Lynn like from earlier in the year. <laughs> where he puts up minus 12. So, like, Bry got some ne- some bad luck with the uh, with some of his relief pitcher streamings, like negative 21 from Jalen Beeks and negative 19 from Carlos Hernandez. But some of his big uh, ace caliber pitchers, like those guys, certainly let him down this week. That's not to discredit what Paul did. Paul had a strategy, went into it, um, got into, the, into it this week and executed uh, perfectly. So... He got the win, congrats, and he also actually had less pitching starts than Bry too. So it's actually interesting to see that Chad, Jamie, Paul, and Connor all won this week having less pitching starts than their opponents. So that's kind of cool to see. That's what we like to call a narrative, and I think you were trying to say something before. Yeah, uh, I mean, shout out Paul for winning. I remember I was on the podcast but I remember listening back to it, and Paul had the confidence, and you know the team came out and performed. Another interesting stat: not only did uh, uh, Bry have more starts, but the amount of players played or batters played, excuse me, Bry had t- Paul outbeat by eleven. Uh, Bry had seventy-two bats, uh, and Paul had sixty-one, or at least starts. So it was just about the guys that Paul played stepping up big time. Luis Arias at fifty. Brian Hayes, former Beach Dog, 53, Corey Seager, you know, really just hitting another gear, especially recently at 71 points this week. I mean, yeah, shout out Paul. I mean, he, he called his own shot, and you got to respect that. I'll say exactly. one more quick thing. I've And I said it to Cody and PMs earlier. In 16 years of playing fantasy baseball, I have never worked harder to get a regular season win over the course of a seven day week in sixteen years. I every every day, almost every other hour, I was spending my time looking at free agents, trying to find, you know, guys to plug and play. So the fact that Bry does this every freaking week, I have no idea how he does it because it is exhausting. Yeah, I mean I remember when I played Bry, I did a lot of the same things. And some of it I've actually carried over to other matchups, as uh, Hen saw today. I think Jacob Junis was the guy's name, gave me like over 10 points. Um, but, I mean, we saw it against Paul this week. There was one guy, Bry, I think it was Cesar Hernandez. Was that his name? Some, yeah, he gave him like negative 19 in Cesar one. Cesar Hernandez. Or Cesar Former Hernandez, Philly. right? Former Philly, yeah. So the, the strategy works. But then sometimes it can really cost you. I mean, you take away um, Hernandez there. Um, but yeah, let's say he doesn't start Hernandez that one day. Yeah, Carlos Hernandez, sorry, uh, was his name. So he had negative 19. Let's say he doesn't play him that one game and started Albies today. I think he would have gotten the win um, because yep. it was negative 19 and Albies had 20. So just the volatility of the strategy. But again, huge congrats to you, Paul, calling your shot, getting the win. Let's move on to the next matchup of week number nine. Cody, the commission, Bowling Green Hot Rods, took down Homco 682 to 488. So now that we've done everyone's uh, matchups on the pod, I apologize because we're trying to get a little bit uh, on time tonight. We're going to now go through every single person's opinions for this one. Let's start with Connor. 
But Connor, what do you think of Cody's victory over Homko? I think it's a bittersweet one because Cody measures against Hyatt and some of the uh, other best teams in the league, but this is an under 700 point matchup soon after a Dave loss. I think for the hot rods there, I mean, it's a clear win. Um, we've talked for weeks about Homko's bats being great, but the pitching um, not doing so much uh, that continued 366 to 250 for the bats, but this matchup was really one with the pitching 316 to 238. Uh, Manuel Classe with 39, just looking terrific this week. I think Paul's mentioned before the relief pitching is kind of underrated in this league, and that really shows here. Um, for Homko, I think there are some good pitching signs, though. Geron and Estevez had to combine 55. Lily Varland had a terrific start out of nowhere, so. Um, one of the best teams in the league beat a team that's now one and seven, one and eight, I think, but or no, one seven and one, excuse me. But um, uh, I'm really curious to see how Hamco does in the next couple weeks. Well, it should be interesting to see Tita. What do you have to say? Bracton legend Griffin Canning, sixty-one <laughs> points. This week, in a two-start week uh, for the for the Canapolis Cannonballers, uh, you know he had some good starts. It's just tough to keep up with Cody you, when you when you play Cody. You just can't kind of like playing height and Jamie. You know you just can't have any off days. You gotta you gotta put up points each, each day each week. Um, and then you know I don't think Cody's bats went crazy at all. You know, for what they could do. Um, you know, Wander had 34, Nico Horner 30, Austin Riley 20. I mean, so there's a lot. This was a week that you could get Cody. Uh, those those weeks aren't going to happen often. Um, so when you have a chance to get them, you, you got to you gotta finish it. And uh, it just didn't work out. You know, Cody survived and advanced and with a W. And, uh Homco is going to be ready to go. He's high playing this week, so I'm sure those bats will go crazy. Will be fun to watch. Paul, what do you have to say? So I'll make it real quick uh, for Homco. He has the tough part already solved, in my opinion. He has the arms, I think, to compete. Um, it's his bats. You know, it's his bats. He's got to really, you know, try and find a couple bats here and there. 250. If I mean, I know he's won seven and one or whatever is his record, his worst record in the league. This roster does not reflect that. Um, he's gotten some tough breaks, but he he has he has the be- the arms to to win, which is the tough part. So now you know, find an ar- find a good bat or two, and you'll start getting wins. As for Cody, uh, Cedric Mullins going down this week was tough. Fortunately for Cody, he has the depth to overcome that. Um, and then making a trade for a certain arm that we're going to talk about later. Um, you know, it's it it just proves that Cody can kind of do whatever he wants. Because um, you know, he, he has so much depth, he has so much talent that he's going to find ways to win. Um, but we'll see. We'll see where that'll get him in September. You never know. Injuries the wrong one at the wrong time that's your season definitely and what do you have to say about this one yeah I mean you know a standard performance by Cody and another injury that you know could be interesting to look out for Andre Franco obviously something that's kind of been tied to me and Cody's legacy or at least season thus far and obviously you never want injuries to happen Wanda Franco out with a hamstring injury didn't play in today's game listed as day-to-day right now, but, you know, hammies, hamstrings, always a bit of a weird subject. Obviously, you'd want him to stay healthy just for the league of baseball and the state of the league just because of how exciting of a player he is, but you know, that would obviously be a big blow if he can't, you know, if he's out for long-term. Obviously, he has Matt McLean, who almost outscored Wander uh, 32 points to 34, so you know, hopefully he's all right, but it is something to keep track of nonetheless. And Bracton. Yeah, um, I think 
I'm going to disagree with what Paul was saying about Homco's team a little bit. I think Homco has the bats but doesn't have the arms. Uh, injuries to Alec Bohm and Riley Green certainly don't help. Um, I think he, he lost Riley Green fairly early in the week. Yeah, Green only had five at-bats, which is unfortunate. Michael Harris has just completely fallen off a cliff, which is also not very helpful. But if he can turn that around, that's that's a big get for him, and he should get Bowman and, and, and Green back hopefully soon. That would help. But as far as Cody's team is concerned, um, it's scary to me that this could have even been better than the 682 that he put up because Shane McClanahan kind of had a down week with 13. Aaron Nola only had seven. Zach Wheeler went negative, but now he's gone, which we'll talk about later. But he did get some good starts from Brandon Williamson had 27. Bobby Miller in a two-start week had 66, which is absolutely insane. And uh, we you know, we just ripped on Carlos Hernandez with Bry. This is one of our favorite topics of the week is who gets negative points for both teams. Uh, Carlos Hernandez had negative three for Cody this week too, which is uh, pretty funny given what he did for Bry as well. But it's interesting to see that Vladimir Guerrero's time, uh, Vlad, uh, Vlad Jr. is kind of turning it around a little bit at 46 points this week. And I know Hen mentioned that Matt McLean almost outscored Wander Franco, but it was literally uh, with double at-bats, 24 at-bats for McLean to 12 for Franco, just showing how great of a player Franco is and how big of a loss it could be if he's out for a while. But Cody's team continuing to roll. I still say he's the class of the league, and he'll keep going, and he's my favorite to win it all. So um, I, I know I'm going to get curb stomped by John Height next week for saying that, but uh, it's whatever at this point. Yeah, I'll let the matchup talk for that one. But anyway, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'll just add to this. Um, one trade that I'm actually I'm a little surprised it really worked out because he was kind of bad for me. He was bad for another team, I think, that had him before. But Alex Bregman has been a dog for Cody. I think he's the second-ranked third baseman at the moment. Had an insanely slow start to the season. Like, my God, I think all of us could bat better than what he was doing early on. But he's really turned it on as of late. Had a big 24-piece at one point during the week. Um, he's got up to eight homers. He's been on fire lately. So that's really been helping Cody out with Austin Riley being somewhat slow to start the season. Um, but, yeah, good win by Cody. And, again, Homco has got plenty of good pieces. I love Yuri Perez. He had another good start this week. I think he had 26. Um, so I think the wins are going to come for Homco. Like I think Paul said, um, too good of a team to not start rattling off some wins. All right, we got two more matchups to talk about before we head to the deals. We have... Dave versus Chad, and Chad got back in the win column. The Oklahoma City Dodgers won 498 to 459. So, Bracton, we'll start with you and go backwards this time. What did you think of this matchup? Yeah, we've been talking a little bit about how Chad's team's been like a, a showcase team for some of the top teams in the league as far as certain players go. And I mean, now it's now we're really starting to see it. Nick Castellanos had 62 points this week, and we noticed uh, that Chad's been active in the trade block trying to get a deal done for that. I, I think he said he was a top 30 player overall. Right now he's the sixth ranked right fielder on fan tracks, which is kind of wild. Um yeah, just just looking over a little bit, he got forty three points from Tommy Henry, which is absolutely insane. But not a lot of other pitching performances. He's the only team besides me that didn't crack a hundred pitching points this week. So winning with that and not hitting the twelve uh, start max, he had two less starts than Dave. Um, it's a pretty yeah, pretty impressive feat there for him. But. Uh, Dave's found some some pretty good pieces. Uh, my best friend Spencer Torkelson had another thirty point week for him, and Josh Jung is is a freaking baller. So um, is this was this was a not a great showing from Dave, but I think he'll bounce back because I do like some of the players that he has. But uh, Chad should be happy for this week. Good win by Chad Hen. What do you have to say? I mean. Pretty surprising win for Chad. Really got a lot going from the bats. His bats actually outscored me this week. Nick Cassianos, who kind of been spearheading the, the Phillies offense recently. 62 points, amazing performance. I know if he hasn't already gotten messages about from competing teams about him, I think we'll be fielding them soon. It's almost a six, over a six-point bat. You know, top 10 outfielder. 
doing his thing. I mean, I think, you know, solid week overall. Also, Luis Garcia got him 41 points. Uh, Owen Miller in that first – not Owen. Owen Miller in the first pace slot. But, I mean, I think, you know, obviously these are two teams, two teams of players who are more displaying for the other competitors who people can go after. I guess I wouldn't be surprised if Nick Castellanos does – it moved and then it's pretty shocking that someone could and even with the 94 uh pitching points but you have almost over 400 uh hit bat points with your bats i guess anything's really possible definitely and paul what do you have to say about this one uh i'll keep mine brief um good win for chad uh the most intriguing player i think and maybe it's just because i was watching the white Sox game today Jake Berger. So Jake Berger was a former first round pick. Kind of a guy that's been, you know, under the radar, injured, you know, what have you. I mean, he he didn't play him a whole lot this week, but he's a guy that every time I see a White Sox game, I feel like he's hitting a home run. And maybe it's because he hit three against the Orioles when they played this year, but he's a guy I feel like is a good piece for a team like Chaz. You know, maybe not the most heralded guy, but a guy that is going to get Chad through the tough times right now and kind of be the bridge for Chad, like, for when he competes in a year or two. Um, I, the player I'd really like, you know, as for Dave, he's got some injuries he's dealing with. Carlos Correa, negative one point. Um, you know, he'll he'll be fine, I think, long term, but it's it's a tough week this week. Definitely was. Tita, what do you have to say about this one? Just looking, you know, these are two really good owners that we have uh, here. And, you know, we're Tito, I'm having trouble hearing you over here. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's yeah, you're better. good. Okay, my bad. But you just look at, at each each of these two guys, and, and they're going to be good owners. They're going to do everything uh, to to get their teams right for the future. Um, I do agree about Castellanos. Uh, you know, he's going to be a, a good ad for someone. Um, you know, if you look, you know, you look at the pitching, which was just so bad for Chad, and uh, just the, and then you look at Dave's bats. I mean, you know, minus five from Seth Brown, who's a guy who's streaky. Um, Santander, you know, who I've traded once or twice. He put up forty four. Uh, Josh Lowe, Lau, uh, I mean, he went crazy for about a month, and he had seventeen this week. And so, I mean, you, you can look Patrick Wisdom minus two for the week. So it's just you can look up and down Dave's roster, and, and there's guys that that are streaky. And if you you know he just got called on one of those weeks where they were streaking the walk the wrong way. So I expect, like I said, both these teams they are going to build, keep building for the future. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they upset another team or two along the way. And Connor, you're up last. I'd like to highlight one player from each team. Um, for Dave, I think Tita made an interesting deal to move Carlos Correa. I think the logic was that it wasn't flashy, and he really didn't perform this week. But I think a lot of Dave's success, if Correa is moved, is going to hinge on when that short stop comes back. And then for Chad, I have my eye on Tommy Henry. The first four or five starts, the Diamondbacks started the not really look good, but in the last three, he's had a couple 30 and 40 point starts. So, while the strikeout numbers aren't good, that could be a contender for waiver wire bind of the month if uh, those results continue. Definitely could be. So, now we got one last matchup to talk about before we head to the deals. The Tampa Tar Ponds, owned by Jamie, took down Richmond Flying Squirrels, owned by Scott. 702. 2539. Paul, I'll let you lead off of this one. What did you see? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm going to try and keep it brief. Uh, Jamie's got a great team. Um, 
really balanced effort this week. Over 300 points for both pitching and hitting. Can't ask for much more than that. Even with a Josh Hader blow-up week, he, he made up for it with a Jordan Romano 37-point week. So uh, he he's killing it. He knows he's killing it. He's got a great team. Wins are rolling out for him. Um, you know, as for Scott, he's got a decent team as well. 62 out of Ryan McMahon is a lot. Um, you know, he's just got to keep, keep that up, keep grinding, keep finding uh, Ben Lively's of the world. We scored 35 this week. I, I have no idea who this guy even is, but it's two weeks in a row that he's gotten a, a good showing um, out of this guy. Um, so just keep finding those diamonds and keep competing. And Tita, you're up next. Well, looking at it, um, I mean, Jamie's tough to beat any anyway on a regular week. I mean, you look at his pitching, and all of his pitchers it seemed like went crazy. Besides Hater, um, you know, looking at Scott. Um, Jake Fraley had 54, which could be another good playing in that ballpark. Uh, could be another good piece for teams, uh, you know, down the road. Uh, a guy I've tried to get from Scott a few times, Royce Lewis, came out in a, with a bang earlier this week, kind of got in a little uh, collision. Uh, he's been out. And then Ryan McMahon's another piece. I mean, Ryan McMahon's a guy I've, I think if you play fantasy baseballs, it always is kind of teased. But, I mean, it, look, it looks like he's finally putting it together. Um, and like I said, Jamie's just a machine. I mean, his bats are are real deal. Um, it all comes down to him putting in, you know, the right amount of work to, to kind of even his team out so it's not so top-heavy. So, like I said, I think this was what everybody expected. But, like I said, I, I can see Scott beating – another team or two along the way and I can see Jamie, you know, keeping on winning. I think he's one of the top three teams in our league. So anxious to see him. And Connor, you're up. Well I think Jaime's team is very top heavy, like Tita said. I think only eight starters had points, which for almost any team is just insane. Um I think there definitely should be some moves made close to the deadline. I mean, some of the bench players on Jaime's team, Prado, Chase, Mydroth, I've never even heard of. Uh, those could happen because there are injuries. Uh, Chris Sale got injured, so how is he going to be replaced? So I'll be really curious to see what moves are made uh, by that team up to the deadline. And then Scott, I think, has done a really nice job of moving the roster in the right direction since uh, taking ownership of the team in April, but uh, he's had a couple surprise wins and hopefully more to come. And Hen. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy to say that a guy who scored 700 points this week could have had three more starts. I mean, I think that's been the story of Jamie's team really the entire year is just not getting that 12 start max threshold and really wonder how his team stacks up or, you know, is his team the best when he actually gets all 12 of those starts and, I don't think it's just a management issue. I just think he needs an extra rostered starting pitcher right now. He only has eight on his team right now. And I think if you add another guy there, even if it's a low-end starter who can get you 15 points, who's like a 15-point pitcher, reaching that 12th game threat, 12 star threshold is just going to get him a long way. And he has the bats to compete. It's just a matter of getting the amount of quality starts to compete with the other top dogs in the league. Bracton, you have the last word. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. Uh, I've been challenging Jamie every week on the podcast to, hey, get that 12 starts. Uh, I would I would love to see him somewhere. I think he could be around the 800-point mark every week with a full 12 starts, and if he can do that, that's scary. Um, maybe it's just because it's the regular season he's not doing that, and when he, when he gets to the playoffs, he'll absolutely have 12 starts. I don't really know, but... And the starts that he does have, like 44 from Alex Cobb, continues to look good despite us saying that that's one of the worst trades of the year. 48 for you, Darvish. 47 for Kevin Gosman. 41 for George Kirby on a rebound week. Uh, 
Michael Kopech, 49 points, I believe, in a two-start week. Uh, and some, some other 37 points from Jordan Romano, too. So, I mean, he had he finished third in, in the league in, in hitting points, third in the league in pitching points, and third in the league in total points this week. So, another big win for Jamie. I'm uh, just going to see him continue to roll going on forward for the rest of the year here. But... I'd really like to see what he can do consistently with 12 starts. I mean, that'd be pretty interesting. Definitely something to look out for. Jamie's team has been red hot. Now, that'll wrap up the matchups portion of the pod. We're already on to the best part, the deals. So, for this episode, what we're going to do is I'll ask each member of this podcast episode to talk about any deals that you made throughout the week. It wasn't the busiest week, but there was a lot of huge deals that went down. Um, and then after you give your deals, if there's anything else you want to talk about, bring it up. I'm going to start with Hen. I mean, for obvious reasons. Uh, so Hen, uh, you're up first. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound facetious, but I might be on the receiving end of probably the two biggest deals this week. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think about cause I didn't even feel like it was a week ago, but, uh, Monday, the day after last week's pod, uh, Logan Webb from Bracton for Freddie Peralta, Tamar Johnson, and Brooks Lee. A thought process there was, you know, obviously, uh, I thought Freddie Peralta was going to be that ace for me. I actually gave up a lot more in that deal, I feel like, than I did for the steal. Really didn't end up working out that well. Uh, Logan Webb's been a very consistent pitcher for the past couple of seasons, plays in a very pitcher-friendly ballpark. And, you know, while Tamar Johnson and Brooks Lee are great prospects, I feel like, and I still think this is the case, I have some prospects. You know, if I need to buy an arm to compete, I think I could do that. And, you know, with the short, with Beauchette being my shortstop, losing Brooksley isn't as bad. And then Bar Johnson, I feel like that's the price you have to pay for getting a really good pitcher. And then uh, for the other deal, my other major deal obviously happened just a couple hours ago. Uh, Sandy Alcantara, I gave him, I finally gave up on him. I saw him pitch have an absolute dud against the awful Oakland Athletics. Uh, very weird game. Uh, there was like a, there was a couple of bunts. He tried picking off someone and overthrew it. He gave up, I think, five runs. So I was like, look, if you can't do well against the A's, I don't know if I can trust you really in any big game. So I got Zach Wheeler, Mason Wayne, Colton Kowser, Tyler Locklear. Hoping Zach Wheeler can kind of maintain form as a low 20s point per game pitcher on cows are top 20 25 spec in baseball tyler lockley has been mashing the ball in the minors and then hopefully mason wins offense can kind of catch up with his defense but yeah i mean those are the big deals and i also got andrew abbott who has been one of the best pitchers in the minors just actually got called up and will be making his mob debut tomorrow um good deals to look at for you this week and any other circumstances, I lead off with you, Tita, but obviously Hen had the Sandy trade. But you're up right now. Talk about your deals for the week. Well, I'll finish where uh, Hen kind of left off, where you know I traded him Ab- Andrew Abbott uh, for Dylan Lesko and my 24 first-round pick. I've been bugging uh, Hen for my first-round pick since I think I got in the league. Um, so... You know, we we we, talk, we me and him talked about you know Abbott was probably going to be up soon, which you know we knew that I knew that. You know, I, I want to get Lesko as another piece in return um, to possibly move for a shortstop, which I did a little while ago, and then just get my first round pick back. Um, it just allows me to kind of do what I need to do uh, and have that available if I want to trade that as well. Um, you know, trading Lesko a little while ago and yell it for um, Dan's Johnson. Um, me and Homco have been talking for probably about three or four days. Um, at first, he wanted Edmund and let's go. And I wasn't going to do that because I don't know if I trust uh, Morrell, Donovan, as everyday second base guys for me right now. Um. So we kind of settled on Yellick today uh, and Lesko. And, and I think Lesko is going to be a dude. Um, but for me, you know, getting Dansby 
a six point per game bat that's a shortstop for me. That's my one of my weak weak points of my lineup. Um, as a Braves fan, I've seen him when he's at his best and when he's at his worst. But um, he, he to me, he's a, he's easy a top ten shortstop, um, and, and that's kind of what what my team did. Um, I don't think I made a whole lot of. I mean, I did. I traded Buxton for Altman, uh, Paulino, and Jorge Mateo, which I was just going to try to flip Mateo. I wanted Altman. Um, Buxton had been pretty uh, healthy this year, but I knew it was only a matter of time before he got hurt. Uh, Altman started off great, and he's been struggling, but he's still a young bat, 25 years old. Um and so I think you know he's got a bright future, and so I met, and I, gra- I gained another spec slot which I need. Um, so it was kind of I ended up dropping Mateo after I couldn't find anybody to take him, and then I was able to trade on Monday. I made two trades actually, and then I made I traded Dylan Cease and Dylan Carlson for Drew Smiley, Andrew Abbott, Miguel Blyce. And Tommy Edmond, I uh, want, want to add it because I want to be able to flip him as well. Smiley is just a guy to be a worst case to get your 12 starts. Um, Cease is just up and down. Um, so that was kind of my thought process. And, and then get another chance to get Edmond, who I really like, I think. Tommy Edmond's a good player. Um, and then I want to think it's my last trade, but I made it on Monday. I traded uh, uh, Wilson Contreras to Connor for Mason Hour and uh, J.D. Martinez. So Martinez was actually probably my best bat this week. Uh, he's been tearing it up. Right now he's a seven-point bat. Um, and, you know, uh, he's old. So he's, I'm going to have to ride it out with him. And then and then Hour, Mason Hour, I've been trying. I've liked him for a little while. He's a high K, high power, upside kind of outfielder. Uh, so he's got tools, but, you know, he, he's he's got some developing to do. So all in all, it wasn't as busy week as I usually have, but it was pretty productive. You guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just lagged out. So, good deal, as always, Tita. We'll head to you all next. I'll talk about your deals and anything else you saw. So, I only really made one deal this week. I, I made two, technically. I traded um, this is Kyle Hendricks to Dave for a third round pick. I mean, not a big deal there. So, the main deal, the big deal of the week, the deal that broke the league. Uh, I gave Justin Steele to Bry, and I got Ryan Nelson, Christian Vaccaro, and a fourth-round pick. Um, as most people saw, probably, uh, Justin Steele had a start on Thursday, I believe it was, um, that he was removed after three innings because of forearm discomfort, uh, which we all know, I think, I mean, most of the time means Tommy John surgery. And so I was panicking. I wanted to try and move him for something because I didn't want to sit on him for two years, pretty much. Um, so, I mean, I got what I got. Ryan Nelson, he was a top 100 prospect coming into the year. Um, hasn't been great for the Diamondbacks so far. Uh, his last couple starts have been particularly rough. Um, maybe he'll turn around, hoping he turns it around. Uh, and then Christian Vaccaro, I've read about him, 18-year-old kid from uh, Cuba on the Nationals outfielder. Uh, very toolsy, uh, but also very young. So a lot, a lot of ways he can go. Um, I mean, I panicked. It's probably a bad deal for me, uh, especially since they've really downplayed the seriousness of Justin Steele's injury. Um, I'm not saying I hope he has Simon John surgery, but it would certainly more justify this deal. Um, because if he's pitching for Bry in a couple weeks, I look like an absolute idiot. Um, but we'll see. 
Uh, but I'll, I'll make a quick comment on the Sandy trade that happened tonight. Uh, both Hen and Cody were kind of feeling me out on the trade. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say exactly what I told them. Um, you know, Sandy is a guy that was amazing last year, but I think he's kind of been bogged down by the pitch clock this year. Um, I'm not sure if we'll see the Sandy of 2022 again. Uh, if we do, you know, I think he's far and away the best player in the deal. Um, but I think Cody paid a pretty hefty price. You know, Zach Wheeler has been pretty good this year. Um, I mean, 10 days ago, I owned Mason Wynn and Colton Kowser, and I think pretty highly of both of them. Uh, Kowser a little bit higher than Wynn. And then I think Tyler Locklear is a top 100 prospect. Um, so I like the haul that Hen got. Um, especially for an ace arm like that, though. But, again, if Sandy can be the pitcher he was last year, Cody, far and away, just blew this out of the water because he, he has the best player. Um, and just a, just another top arm for Cody to the rich get richer. Connor, uh, talk about your trades this week. So to, I guess the first deal really was the Wilson Gutierrez or J.D. Martinez one. Um, that's the first deal, or I got J.D. Martinez for, I believe it was Cody's 2025 first in Everson Perriera. And that might be the first deal I've done with John Height where I'm actually happy with the result a week or two later. Um, <laughs> but I needed a premium position after Alejandro Kirk uh, wasn't playing as much. So I traded for Contreras and... Now with Danny Jansen on the injured list, that seems a little redundant, but I think at such a premium position, I can definitely flip one or both of those. And then the rest of my trades were pretty much a your thought. Um, I traded for Tyler Glass now shortly before last week's pod, and then I subsequently moved him for Joe Musgrove from Cody. I like Musgrove more than Glass now, just given the health concerns, so... I was very happy with that. Moved Musgrove to Tita, and essentially just whittled down to get some more prospects. Um, I've been buying a lot of Ronzi Contreras shares recently. Uh, I think he's an electric young arm that has just had some rough starts against great teams, so I hope he can be a contributor on my team for years to come, and then uh, just trying to continue to sell. So not too busy of a week for me, but hopefully we can do more positioning going forward. And Bracton, uh, talk about your stuff. So the first deal I made was actually on our podcast last week because we went until like 1 in the morning last week. We got I got Kevin Parada from Paul for Joey Weimer, who had a great week, of course, right when I deal him, he has a great week. And uh, also gave up Victor Acosta and Gavin Stone in that deal. I love Kevin Parada. I view him as a top 30 prospect. Um, I'm also a Mets fan, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that deal. But um, kind of a weird deal I made with Connor where I gave him Bryce Terang and uh, Worst and Carlos Colomarez, I think. I don't know how you pronounce it. For Juan, Lepe- Juan Yepes, Austin Gomber, and Ryan Papayat. I just view that trade as basically Bryce Terang for Papayat. And I like taking gambles on uh, young arms that I think might be pretty good. So I like that deal. Um the big one, Logan Webb for Freddie Peralta, Tamar Johnson, and Brooks Lee. Um, I think if Freddie Peralta pitches the way I think Freddie Peralta can pitch, that this isn't even really that big of a downgrade from Logan Webb. It's just the inconsistency, as Hen mentioned, with uh, with Peralta that's there. It kind of makes it appear to be an obvious downgrade, but... Getting Tamar Johnson and Brooks Lee, who I view both as top 20 prospects in this league, um, was worth it for me. I, I think both of them are going to be outstanding. I think Tamar Johnson is the best second base prospect in baseball. And I think Brooks Lee could play third base, which would be really big, especially if Ellie De La Cruz doesn't for me. So I, I envision keeping these guys long term unless I'm able to flip them in exchange for uh, an ace type package. But... I'm perfectly happy waiting on them because I think they're two of the of two elite prospect talents. I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but for those two guys, I feel like it's wor- warranted. Uh, I also traded Cody Chris Bryant and Braden Shoemake for Jackson Job and Akil Badu. It's another thing 
for me to get one of those lottery ticket arms on a team that I actually think has some quality pitching in Detroit. I like Jackson Joe a lot. I think he's one of the best pitching prospects in baseball. So to kind of add him to my mix with uh, Gavin Williams and, and Ricky Tiedemann, uh, I view Job as a top 100 prospect. So looking at that kind of makes me a little happy there. I am going to comment on the Sandy Alcantara trade. That's the only trade I didn't make out of this mix. But I think Cody far and away did really well here. Uh, I I believe the age difference between Zach Wheeler and Sandy Alcantara is six years. But somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think it's six. I thought it's four. I thought it was oh, six. Or or is it five? Wait, how old is Sandy? Twenty seven. Is it Wheeler thirty two or thirty three? Zach Wheeler turned thirty three. Yeah. So. So it's, it's yeah. six years. So okay, I was right. So so for six years of good pitching play, Cody gives up. A shortstop that he doesn't need. Tyler Locklear is kind of like a meh prospect to me. I do like Colton Kowser, but Cody has the outfield depth when there is an injury. So, I like looking at this. I feel like Sandy Alcantara fits in if he's if he's playing well and playing the way he knows how. I think he's one of Cody's best arms for a thirty three year old a defensive shortstop, a worst in my mind, and and Colton Kowser, who I like, but. As far it's a win now deal for Hen, so I think if if Hen can win some games out of it, it'll be okay. But long term wise, I really like what Cody did there. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see. Uh, I only made a couple of trades this week. Um, glad I made the Blake Snell trade with Connor. This is the second straight week where I made a trade. Um, it ended up helped me win a week. I did the Jorge Soler trade. Uh, with Chad to help me beat Tita. I think it was last week. And then this week, Blake Snell gave me around 30 points, which um, helped me beat Hen. So I was happy about that. Gave up a decent bit for a guy that's been pretty bad all year, but I think he, he's starting to turn it around. Um, had a couple unlucky breaks here and there. So hoping that stays the same. And the only other small trade I made, I'm trying to clear some roster space. Got some things in the work and people coming back. Love DJ LeMayu, one of my favorite Yankees, but had to let him go. I got a pretty good. Astros prospect and Jacob Melton. I think he's their second ranked prospect right now. And just the second as well. But Connor gets a pretty good bat there that's going to help him right now. I'm going to comment on the Sandy trade. I'm going to talk about my point of view and um, at least from my perspective. And is it safe to say I had a top three offer or would you say he's a top four or five? Uh, I mean, wait, let's see. I'm trying to think. Ah. I don't know. I think there were two offers that were yeah. kind of by far and away exceeded what I was doing. And I didn't add, I said this all fun, but I was actually very close to doing a deal with Smell and Cody came in at the 11th hour. I actually was going to grab something for dinner and I was like, oh, I'll just push it off and I'll tell Smell cool. afterwards I'll do it. And then Cody was kind of persistent. Uh, I had a couple of pieces that I kind of, you know, couldn't walk away from. I mean, it had a solid offer. I my big thing was that I wanted a bigger headliner than what you were offering. Yeah. Is so especially since on the guys you were all, well, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter at this point. Eduardo Rodriguez, I don't know when the hell he's pitching again, and so you know, obviously, if I was going to give up, a, if I was going to take a guy like him, you know, maybe if he was healthy, that's a different story. But it could be out at least another month, if not longer. So I don't know. I mean, I got good offers all around. But I think Cody, with the fact that I had a pit, he pro- he offered the best arm, major arm, and then I also got prospects in return who also I like who I can either keep or I can flip for you know, more win now players. So I I thought that Cody had the best offer. That's just my opinion. I mean, I took it. So yeah, I'll say my offer. Um, it did have Erod in it. It had Seawald. It had a first, and I also had Altuve in there. I thought. That made perfect sense because you really need a second baseman. And I actually was, I mean, as it was happening, obviously I really wanted Sandy. I wanted Sandy back since I traded him away when I first joined the league. Um, Altuve's kind of been that missing bat you need in at least that second base spot. So I was like, crap, that kind of fixes that if if it goes through. So it kind of worked out in a way. Um, The thing I'll say about this trade, um, because I'm going to kind of bring up what I talked about when you guys made the Wander trade, is you, you, you look at the haul that you got, and 
Um, Zach Wheeler, obviously, still been great. A little bit inconsistent. I know the Phillies haven't been great this year, but the strikeouts, you know, are there. Um, I love, I mean, Colin Cowser was a former yard good at one point. Uh, not huge on Mason when I know he's more of a defensive guy. And then Tyler Lockley is still a, a decent prospect. I'm going to say this. Um, no matter what happens with Sandy, I just feel like this is similar to what, I mean, actually, it's not similar, but it's under the same lines that, okay, Cody gets, or, or what was it, Hen? Hen, you got Drew Jones, right, in the one trade? Yes. That no matter what, for the next at least two years, since Sandy's like, whatever, 27, um, even if Sandy becomes just, you know, good and not Cy Young worthy, the amount of sand, the amount of value that Sandy's going to have going forward, I think is going to trump a lot of the pieces that Hen got back in this trade, which it was going to come as expected. Um, there's still a lot of risk involved that Sandy could, I guess, stink it up the rest of the year, which I don't think it's going to happen. I know the start against the A's was pretty funny, and I just don't understand why he's been bad lately. I know the pitch clock was a big concern. But I just think um, getting Sandy Alcantara, um, it's definitely going to make Cody's pitching even better regardless of what happens. Um, for me, as a funny thing, I'm excited to kind of play him again in two weeks because um, I don't think he'll figure it out by then. But uh, I just think long-term, the value that Sandy still has in this league and will have in this league um, kind of makes this deal a little bit more justifiable for what he gave up. Um, but definitely a good win now move for Hen. And then, again, if Sandy turns around in a month, I mean, his pitching, Cody's pitching could be reaching 400 points um, in a week, you know, in a given notice. But that will do it for all the deals for this week. So now last part of the show, let's talk about the matchups. And for this, we'll let everyone give their two cents in because we'll keep it obviously a little bit shorter because a lot of people have to talk. Let's rip the Band-Aid off, Bracton. Let's do our matchup first, and I'll let you go first. You're going to beat me by 200 points or more. 200 maybe being generous. Um, I think it's not even going to be fucking close at all. It's, it's going to be... It, it might even be three or 400. It's given I'm... I don't even know. I, let's, I'm just hoping for some nice segments on the menial wins column for next week. So I, I'm not going to win. I already know. So that's it. Uh, Hen, what do you have to say? Very positive outlook, Bracton. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Bracton's kind of right. Uh, John Height's probably going to win this pretty convincingly. I'll say it's within like 225. I don't know. I don't know what How the generous. Vegas line is, but. <laughs> How generous. <laughs> Jesus, that is that is sad. Okay, uh, Paul, you're up. So, John Height, do you have like a vacation planned this week? Uh, oh God, <laughs> I, no. Because you, you easily could. I think you could. You know, d- delete the app, close out Discord. I think just roll with what you got, and you'll be fine this week. Uh, I mean, I'm. Braxton's already been too mean on himself, so I won't be any more mean than that. But uh, do it; I deserve it. You know, it's fine. Braxton, Braxton, you know what you have. You have a good future. I really like your prospects. I really like your youth. But it's John Knight this week. Uh, Connor, you're up next. I'm going to give a lot of credit to Braxton's team. Um, obviously, I think their risk of taking younger players and especially pitchers, there are going to be some ups and downs. And the last two or three weeks, there have, quite frankly, been more downs. That said, I think Bryce Miller is not going to have negative points. So uh, Height is going to win this, but I could definitely see Brackton having a much better point total than Van Drax suggests as long as uh, the managing continues and the young players actually do have those highs. And Tita, you'll have the last word. He is not here. Oh, Tita left? Damn, that's sad. Um, I'll say for this week, um, obviously, I'm, I'm confident in my team, but anything can happen. It's fantasy baseball. I've had a couple of weeks so far throughout this win streak that, that I've started off on that uh, my my pitching sometimes just gets a little crazy, just doesn't pitch that well. I think it was against Smell. Um, I kind of had an off week. So, I mean, again, anything is possible. Your bats are good. Again, the pitching has been the issue all season long. It's gotten better. 
um, since we first really talked about it early on in the season. But again, uh, especially some of these these bats on your team, John Endy is a dog. We've we've talked about even though he's not thought of pretty highly in this league for some reason at this point. But Hunter Brown is also a dog. Um, interesting to see. I know you got your twelve starts in. I got I think eleven or twelve um, already in. So um, I'm hoping I win this week. I know I got Cody the week after, which I wish we could just skip over that week. It's not going to be fun. And it looks like I got a call from the commish that Cody will be taking Tita's spot. And Cody, you can uh, talk about this matchup if you want to. Me versus Braxton. I saw you're already talking to me about it. Not, not, not good things, but I was just curious what you have to say. Yeah, so uh, I think I think Braxton's going to pull this one out. He's got two top three shortstops. No, you He's, don't. He's got the Mariners ace. He's got Mike Soroka. I mean, I, I think this is a Bismarck blowout. Calling it now. Thanks for the support. Well, I don't know. Yeah, Fan I again, projects under a hundred. <laughs> Look at that six eleven to five forty three. Fan track <laughs> projection for you, John Height. So, I don't know why they say it's that close, but. If, hey, because you know no, what? I haven't set my lineup for the rest of the week. You know what? I'll make a promise right now. If I keep it under 100 points, I'll give a random person in the league a worst. I'll spin the wheel on next podcast and give somebody a worst. Okay. There's no way that's going to happen. Let's go. So, All right. But you, everyone you heard, root for me this can week. Can I be in that? Can you, can you sure. tank this week? <laughs> uh, no. Focus on winning, then. Okay. Anyway, happen. let's go on to... The next matchup of the week. Actually, Hen, let's go to your matchup. You'll be taking on Scott. <laughs> Hen, you can go first. Uh, what are you expecting this week against Scott? I'm going to win. But see, this is the thing. Now, obviously, Scott doing some good things with this team. The issue with my team, they, I, I, I love beating up on the bad teams. And then when it's the big games... The, the lights the, 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 puppy, the lights are too bright the dogs the dogs become the puppies I, I you know obviously you know, 700 points you know 711 could have beaten every other team this week but it didn't beat the one team I needed to uh you know yeah I'm gonna I mean I'm gonna win I God's got some players but dogs will be barking because the lights are not bright so we we'll fine the dogs will not be put down this week. Cody, you can talk about this one. Yeah, Hen's team is rolling. He's got a very good team. Uh, Scott Scott tends to play, um, you know, play the upset maker when he's playing Paul. But outside of that, you know, there's been a lot of struggles there. I think uh, I think the Beach Dogs win big. I think it's by 300 points. By 300 points, that is the commission's prediction. Uh, Paul, we'll head to you next. You can talk about your favorite team, Scotts. Yeah. Uh, shout out for reminding me that Scott beat me twice this year. <laughs> uh, but I do agree with Hen Dog. His team does kind of play up to better competition, play down to the worst competition. Um, I will take Hen Dog's team this week, but I actually think it'll be somewhat close. Maybe like seventy-five to hundred points. Um, I, I like your arms a lot. I like your bats, obviously, a lot, dog. Um, there's really no reason to pick Scott's team to win, but I think there is reason to pick Scott's team to keep it close. You know, I like Braxton Garrett. Um, I like his bats. Obviously, Lord Guriel is a monster, but. I guess maybe only when they play me. Um, Costas is good. Alvarez is good. Bryson Stott's good. He's got the bats. I've said that. I said it when he beat me twice. I'll say it again. He's got the bats that are pretty good. So I about 100 points, but I'll still take him down. Uh, Connor, what do you have to say about this one? I'm really curious how Hendog's team is going to look a month from now. Um, obviously, there have been a lot of must-win games early on. In the next couple weeks, the Beach Dogs have a simpler stretch. But in late June and early July, I think there's a three-game gauntlet of like Tita, Brian, Paul, whose team has shown they can score 600, 650. 
So when will Hendog, one of the more, I guess, patient owners in a fast-paced league, maybe use some assets to uh, make upgrades on the periphery and really compete or make the decision to uh, scale back a little bit and maybe rebuild? And then, of course, Scott, um, it's a tougher team. He's making some great moves with it, but this doesn't appear to be the week that um, a win will come. And last but not least, the beacon of light, Bracton. What do you have to say about this one? The hounds will bark by two or three hundred points. That's all. You heard it here first. The hounds could be barking once again after a tough loss to the yard goats. We can only wait and see. Let's head to another matchup. We got Bowling Green Hot Rods versus the Rocky Mountain Vibes. Feel like these two teams just played recently. Cody, you can lead us off. Yeah, man, this week is not going to be fun. Uh, Paul mentioned earlier in this podcast that uh, this was one of the more, or this was the most, uh, a try hard weeks uh, that he's played in fantasy. And, you know, to me, you've got to be bright his own game. Uh, every single day, you got to be working the waiver wire, getting who you can get to kind of hang with him. And it's for me, what I try to do is even if I'm getting guys that I don't intend to use, it's guys that I think could have a big game in free agency that Bry's not going to be able to get their hands on. So I'll even play that that game too with him this week. But it's going to be interesting to see. My team has not been just rolling lately. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think that I'm going to pull it out and beat Bry twice this season. But again, I mean, if his streams hit, they hit. There's not a lot you can do about it. So I'm just going to try to play his game, and we'll see what happens. Connor, you're up next. Bring out the popcorn the next two weeks. Cody versus Brian Hyde, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Yeah. I really don't have too much more to add. I guess a lot of it's just going to depend on the streams. And then I think... Cody's been in the market for outfield bats, so I'm curious if like Rodriguez is still going to do well or if those acquisitions are going to need to perform. But yeah, I think Cody's going to win in a close one, but there's just so much variance with the vibes that uh, there could be there could be a 100-point difference or it could be a down to Sunday. And Paul? So I'm, I'm looking at Cody's pitchers, and it seems that uh, McClanahan's got two starts this week. So while I had to do what I did to stay up with Bry and eventually beat him, I would maybe caution Cody just a little bit because he has his talent alone will beat Bry's talent. Just, you know, the core of him versus the core of Bry, I think is is enough to beat him. Um, obviously, Bry can get lucky with his uh, streams, um, but I, w- I would caution Cody just to ne- maybe not every day trying to find the guy that's going to go because you know it could be negative twenty points and that could be the difference at the end of the week. Um, but I will pick Cody. I'll pick him by probably at least a hundred. And uh, Bracton, uh, give your quick prediction. Yeah, I'm going to take Cody, but I do think it's going to be close, and it might come down to Sunday Night Baseball, but it'll be fun to watch. And then, Hen. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Rye is the the, wa- the waiver wizard, uh, as some would like to call him. Cody obviously has the talent, just picked up another, another stud who, knowing my, knowing my luck, probably will... Uh, you know, turn back, but it's what happens. But uh, I mean, obviously, this could be a potential playoff matchup we see, or even a championship matchup, depending on how the bracket breaks down. But I feel like you got to go with the hot rods. They just been consistently the better team. Rye has obviously has a really good team, but he has been a bit shaky the past couple of weeks when he's not as unbeatable as say Cody is. So I'm gonna go with the hot rods. I'll take the hot rods well. Should be an absolute bloodbath this week. And then also when we play the following week for the first time this season. Let's head to the next matchup. Paul versus Dave, the Rochester Red Wings. Paul, what do you think is going to happen? So it's it's less bold this week. 
But I also, again, once again, will predict myself to win. Um, I'm going to still play the stream game a little bit, but I definitely need a little bit of a breather this week. Um, you know, I like my bats. I really like where my bats are. Uh, it's going to come down for me to if Senga can be that, you know, 25, 30 point pitcher that I need him to be. If Singer is for real and is starting to turn it around, uh, 48 points in his last two starts, that's that's what I need. Um, and then my younger guys, you know, the Jared Schusters of the world. Um, I'm not sure if Ryan Weathers will get another start after today, but if he can do something in his next start, um, because I, you can count on Dave to score probably at least 500, 550 points. Uh, I just got to see if it's going to be enough because it, it's 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 a tough stretch. I know coming up after Dave for me. Um, you know I got a big win this week against Bryce, and I'm five wins. Uh, probably need to get at least four or five more wins to have a shot at that seven seed. Um, so this is a big week for me. Definitely will be. And what do you have to say? Uh, obviously, Paul riding high from a big victory against Rocky Mountain Vibes. And I think he's going to carry the momentum into his matchup against Dave this week. Uh, obviously, I think Paul got the experience working the waiver wire. I think if he, can get the st- if he can get the starts over Dave, which he didn't get over Bri, but it didn't matter in the end. But if he can get more starts than Dave, I think he'll, he'll win. I think he'll win decently comfortably. Uh, Connor, you're up. I think I'm going to call an upset here. Um, this is going to come down to one pitching matchup, and I can't believe this. Martin Perez and J.P. Sears, a pitcher for Paul and a pitcher for Dave, essentially have the same starting pitching rank fan tracks. I think it's 66 and 67. Both of them have two start weeks. Perez going against St. Louis and Tampa Bay, and Sears going against uh, Pittsburgh and Milwaukee. If Sears outperforms Perez, I think that the edge in pitching, which is probably the most important piece as we've talked about in this podcast, is going to go to Dave. If not, then Perez returns to his 2021, early 2022 form. We're really going to have a uh, – Paul's going to win. Cody, what's your prediction? Yeah, I think the Red Wings are going to have a better week. You know, Dave is sitting at 3-6. and six. Uh, but, you know, honestly, he should be four and five. He should have never lost uh, to the Dodgers like he did this this past week. Uh, that being said, you know, the Tides, the tide, you know, Paul's got that team rolling, uh, playing well. Um, I think if he does pick up a little bit of the Bryce strategy and hangs on to it, it's just going to bode better for him moving forward. You know, he's sitting at five and four with a ton of prospects and picks. It's going to be interesting to see. You know, if Paul's ready to kind of jump back in after that big, um, I guess you can call a retool he had earlier in the season, he, you know, his team has kind of forced his hand here where he may have to consider kind of reversing the retool. As far as this matchup goes, um, Dave's playing down, Paul's playing up. I'm going to go with the Norfolk Tide. Uh, but I do think I would say between 50 and 100 points because I, th- I think Dave's team plays better than they did last week. And lastly, Bracton. Yeah, I agree with uh, basically what Cody was saying. Just, I, I think Dave's gonna be, Dave's gonna have a good week, but Paul's gonna win. And I, I like this narrative that Connor came up with about JP Sears and Martin per, or Martin Perez. Uh, JP Sears has been a fan favorite amongst the Seton Hall people on this podcast, so uh, I'll be rooting for him. But it'll be, it'll be fun to watch for sure. I think Paul's gonna win though. But it's going to be close. Uh, I'm also going to take Paul. His offense has been rolling. Corey Seager's in the best offense in baseball right now. He had 70 this week. Would not be surprised if he hit 80. Um, just the way the Rangers have been playing. Give me the tides. On to the next one. We're going to do Tita versus Homco. Unfortunately, Tita had to step out a little bit earlier. But thank you for his contributions on the pod tonight. We'll start with Brackton on this one. 
This is a very interesting matchup. Who do you got? Natita's going to win just because homko has got a couple injuries in the bat uh, area that are going to hurt him. I do think Tita has, you know, albeit old, better pitching than Homko right now. So I'm going to go with Tita pretty handily. And, Paul, you're up next. I actually think this might be the match for the week. I mean, I, we all we know Homko's record, you know, worse than the league. We all know that his record doesn't reflect the team that he has. Uh, you know, I'm higher on, I guess I'm higher on his pitching than everybody else because, you know, Tanner, Tanner Hoke I like a lot. Uh, Tyler Beebe I like a lot. Um, he's not really, I think he's got the arms that can compete with his arms. I think there'll be similar pitching at the end. It's, uh, to me, this comes down to the bats. Where you know, I think he just barely got the edge. Uh, just, he has more established names like Corber, like Douglas Garcia, Matt Chat, Ansby Swanson, who Salvi Perez. It's he's, it, if this is a dude off, he's got the dudes. Um, so I'll take I'll take T to <clears throat> thirty to fifty. And what is your prediction? Uh, I think Tita is going to win. You know, I think you never know what his team's going to look like from a week to week basis, but he just finds a way to get to wheels and deals, really. And you no, know, the sounds the sounds are sounding along. I don't know if I if I even use that word properly, but Domko, like his bats, I think his pitching can be inconsistent at times. If he can get some, if he get good performances out of his arms and reach that twelve star threshold. He could compete with Tita till the very end, but I just think the talent on Tita's team outweighs the talent on Homko's team. So Tita will win, say, say right around 137 <coughs> points, you know? Uh, Cody, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, Homko's got the best 1-7-1 and one fantasy team on the planet. Uh, I feel like the guys just had terrible luck. I just checked, and he's uh, third in points against... Uh, the only people who's had more points scored against them is him and, and uh, Jamie, which is kind of, you know, indicative of where him and Jamie's records are. Uh, with Homco, it's even more severe with him sitting at 1-7-1. and one. Uh, And now he gets to play Tita after playing me. You know, it's really hard to pick against Tita. Uh, the only matchup he's lost was against uh, John Height and the Yard Goats. A lot of people's going to lose to John Height and the Yard Goats. Uh, I think this week, I think Homco plays better than he did this past week against me. But I'm still going to go advantage uh, Nashville Sounds. <clears throat> Nashville Sounds. I just think that it will be close. Uh, but I think Tita will make the moves necessary to get him through the weekend and pull off the win. And lastly, Connor. Tita wins this week, but Homco wins in the long run. Um, obviously, Tita's team is built to win now, only has one loss. But Homko scored almost 500 points with the bats two weeks ago and still got a respectable 250 with some major injury. If Homko's bats for a third week performed that well, I think he can definitely fetch a lot more assets. The Swanson deal is kind of the start to that. But I really think Homko's going to be able to set his team well up for the future with a good performance against Tita. Let's say Tita wins by 90 points. Yeah, as much as uh, I have the urge to pick against Tita because he picked against me this week, I am going to roll with the sounds. Team has been electric still as of late. Um, but yeah, Homco's got some work to do, but I'll take Tita by 75 in this one. So we got two more matchups to do before we wrap things up. Let's do Connor versus Jamie. Connor, you'll have the first word here. What do you expect? So last week I had a terrific evening, uh, went to Taco Bell, had some fun with the Taco Bell Chihuahua. Uh, this week is the hangover. I am not feeling this matchup whatsoever. Um, it's going to be a shitty one. I think even though Jaime may not always have the most starts, his star power just far exceeds mine. And my team is going to be more focused towards trying to 
move some of my offensive talent towards either pitching or doing the rebuild I keep say I will, but then I just keep procrastinating because I try to buy people for cheap. So um, I do think that uh, I'm just going to win this pretty cleanly, but hopefully I can uh, impress some folks and maybe sell off some assets in the process. Could be the case. Bracton, what's your prediction? Me and Connor are in the same boat this week. Uh, we kind of just know what's going to happen before it happens. And uh, I guess we'll we'll just be chilling together, watching our teams just get smoked. But um, I think he'll, his matchup at the end of the day will be closer than mine. So I'll give him credit. But uh, I think that Jamie's going to win pretty easily. <coughs> no offense, Connor. I just It's, it's going to be... You and me get against these two juggernauts this week. It's not going to be a fun one, like you said. So, And, Cody, you're up. Yeah, you know, I guess I see this probably a little differently than most. Um, it, I want to say this politely, but uh, this is kind of one of the most aggressive and active managers versus one of the laziest. And I think that's going to play more of a role here in this matchup than we expect. Um, I think Connor's going to be trying to win this matchup from Monday morning to Sunday night. I, that, now, I, you know, I'm not so sure he will, but I do think this is going to be close. Um, I think the Tarpons are going to win. I think it's going to be within 50 points. And what's your thoughts on this? <clears throat> I mean, you know, that's an interesting point by Cody where you look at kind of the philosophy and mindset of both these managers. Jamie's very laissez-faire, hands-off kind of an owner, kind of just sets his lineup for the week and what happens, happens. But I think even with that kind of mindset, he'll still beat Connor. It's just the talent on his team. I, I think if, you know, Jamie was – Committed to always getting 12 starts a week. He probably has a case for being the best team in the league. You just look at his offensive talent and it kind of speaks for itself. But, you know, it really comes down to that pitching. Will they? Will he get that starter threshold? And then will he kind of get to that 12-star mark? Or will he kind of float around that 8-9-star mark, which he kind of generally does? Uh, another thing also to keep note of, um, you know, Eric Cole dealing with a little bit of an injury. He's, you know, probable to start or it's reporting that he might start his start on friday but if he doesn't have him this game maybe won't matter as much but obviously looking towards the future that is something to be taken of regards and and that also adds the fact that he only has now seven starting pitchers instead of eight so i'll say i'll say jamie wins i'll say he wins pretty convincingly i'll give him like the 150 200 range i think his bat's will compensate a lot for maybe the lack of production from his arms. And Paul, you have the final word. Uh, I I think Cody kind of said the same thing I was going to say. You know, I, I'm not going to call Jamie lazy, but he certainly kind of rests on his laurels more than maybe other owners do. Um, you know, and I'm going to say the same thing Hendog said. Garrett Cole potentially not pitching this week is a big deal, I think. I think it's a really big deal. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to pick the upset. I won't do it. I'm going to pick Jamie. But if Connor, if you can get some good starts this week, you know, pull, pull a rabbit out of an occasional hat here and there, I, I think you're going to keep it close. I think this is going to be two teams in the 500s. I'm, I'm going to say that Jamie's going to be in the high 500. He'll be in the low 500. But I, this is the sneaky, closer than most think matchup, I think. And I will say about this matchup, uh, Garrett Cole will be 90% pitching uh, on Friday, I think it is. I think it was just cramping was the reason why he left against the Dodgers. I would be shocked if he didn't pitch, um, unless there's something more serious going on. But... He left because he just had some bad cramping, even though he went through the precautions of not trying to get in that cramp state. I'll still take Jamie in this one. I'm kind of on the Cody Paul uh, line of thought. I mean, um, the way Connor's been managing this team, expect some more bats to potentially come in. 
uh, could help out the offense throughout the week, maybe some arms here and there. Um, but I think we'll be closer than what people are predicting it to be for the most part. So let's head to the last matchup of week number 10, the El Paso Chihuahuas versus the Oklahoma City Dodgers. So we'll start with Bracton for this one. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, I think it's just going to be a really close, fun matchup as far as I, I would call it the matchup of the week, even though it doesn't have like the same playoff implications that other ones have, just because it's going to be so close and interesting. But at the end of the day, I think I'm going to pick Smell. I think Smell's been a little more active on the trade front for guys that will help him right now. I think he's got some absolute dogs on this team, like Spencer Steer and Brian Reynolds. And uh, I think it's close, but I think Smell just has a little more talent, and uh, I'm going to give him the win by under 50 points. And Paul. So this is a super interesting matchup. Again, not for playoff implication, but for number one pick implication because – Right now, these are the 12th and 13th. They're, they have the same record, uh, tied for 12th and 13th, um, with only Homco behind them. But I, I think Homco is going to rattle off three, four, five wins for, over the rest of the season. So I think the loser of this matchup potentially has the inside track for the number one pick um, in next year's draft. Uh, I'm going to give the edge to Smell purely because he has Spencer Steer, and I really like Spencer Steer. Um, I, and it's not great analysis, but these these two teams both have very questionable pitching and very not questionable minor league assets and picks, though. So they, they both know what they're doing. So uh, Mel, I'll take him, you know, 500 to four. 50 something like that Cody you're up next yeah you know <clears throat> not a lot going on here with this matchup um, both teams may struggle to reach 500 what's interesting to me is um, Chad beat Dave last week a team that I, I couldn't beat uh, so you know I want to give Chad some credit for that victory getting to his second win of the season um you know, I, I, for me, I'm going to pick the team that doesn't roster Alec Manoa. So I'm going to go Dodgers win by 75 points. Wow. Uh, Connor, you're up next. I'm going to challenge Cody on this. You're not excited to get about Alec Manoa's start against Houston. Um, that, I believe, is going to be tomorrow. So, But in all seriousness, I think uh, Snell, Smell's going to win this Um Chad is very cautious, great owner, but Smell has shown more of a willingness to buy. So I think if there is a position where it's a close matchup come Thursday or Friday, there could be a more influx of talent coming to the Chihuahua. So just given that and how the teams are currently rostered, uh, Manila with a two-start week, some other talents, I think uh, the Chihuahuas are going to pull this off. And, Hen, you'll have the final word. Yeah, I mean, kind of what Paul said, is this the first tank bowl we're getting this year? I mean, <laughs> two, two, and seven teams duking it out for that number one overall pick. I mean, the stakes don't get much higher than this. Uh, yeah, these are both teams trying to look towards the future, trying to get some assets, build up. It could be a low scoring affair, so some ugly baseball could be displayed here. But um I don't know. I think I'd say Smell wins slightly. Maybe it's because I'm pushing Smell to win because he kinda kinda was disrespecting me after the whole trade situation went down, so I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll give Smell the victory. Chad Chad loses the battle but wins the war, maybe, as they like to say. Uh I can see both teams like scoring under 500 maybe maybe some 450s action but yeah we'll see can i add something really quick john height yeah uh chad owns smells first round pick this year so if we're talking about number one pick he owns his own and connor's and and smells and scott's and mine and dave's so and homco's so it's looking like Chad's going to get the number one pick regardless of who actually finishes in last place. 
So it's a question of how many top five picks is Chad going to get. So That is very interesting. Yeah. Did not know that. Chad is yeah. really building something special. Wow, holy crap. How many second round picks do you have too? Oh my gosh. He has okay. Four seconds and nine firsts, I believe. So Chad so, is set for the future. Yeah. Um I'm gonna lead smell on this one because of one big factor. Um I think Nick Castiano is gonna get traded by the week's end. That's a pretty significant bet in Chad's lineup. Um so I'll lean smell for that reason. Um Chad definitely knows what he's getting a ton of young assets. I gave him some some good pieces for Jorge Soler that worked out for both of us. Wouldn't be surprised if that happens for Castellanos as well. That wraps up the matchups portion of the pod. We've reached the end of this week's episode, so let's go around the table, give our final thoughts. We'll start with you, Connor. Uh, What do you have to say before we wrap things up? I think the league's in a really good spot. Everyone's trying to uh, compete to some extent. As I think Ken Dog mentioned, we are on week, what, nine, ten, and we're about to have the first tank poll. Uh, we're getting close to the deadline, so I'm hoping there can be more of an action-packed week. It was a little bit quieter this week until um, we had a couple monster deals before this fall. But exciting stuff going on. Very exciting stuff indeed. Hen, what do you have to say? Uh, so, you know, couldn't get the win today which is a bit unfortunate. I would have loved that not only to get in the win column and kind of stay in the, the playoff race, because right now I am the eighth seed, although I think my team is talented enough that we can we can make some noise in the playoffs, but we have to get there first. Um, yeah, Sandy, I, I don't know what uh, what else to say about him. No, best of luck to him in Bowling Green, but felt like her time was, it was time to move on. The, the Sandy era did not work out in clear water. And yeah, you know, I, think, I think my next big test in a couple of weeks, I think it's against Tito. So that's what I'm really, really looking forward to. Rattle off a couple of wins and then we'll see how, how the dogs play in some big matchups. Paul, you're up. So Cody kind of briefly hit on it while talking about my matchup. Uh, it, it was obviously bigger news week two or three when I announced my rebuild slash retool. Um, I've kind of turned that around a little bit when I made the deal for Seeger, when I made the deal for Robert, um, even Ian Happ a little bit, um, Jared Klenick, obviously. Um, so it's going to be interesting. I'm not even sure what I want to do yet. Um, Beating Dave, I think, this week would put me, uh, I think it's six and four. I'm not saying I'm going to just start buying everything back and, you know, gearing up for it, but I certainly feel like I will have an opportunity to do so. Um, but we'll see. I, I, I don't want to commit either way yet, and it's a horrible place to be like kind of stuck in the middle. Um, but I I think it'll be pretty clear one way or the other what I'm going to try and do. I'm not saying this week necessarily, but probably by the end of this month, I think I'll have a direction picked. Next up is the world's happiest man, Brackton. What do you have to say? Well, uh, this is my World Series this week. If I can win this game this week, which probably will not happen. It, it actually definitely won't happen. But if I do, I'd be perfectly content with not winning a game the rest of the year. To be the first one to beat John Height would be amazing, but it's not going to happen. But if it does happen, that would be really great. I know that's really, really tip-top analysis, but if my team's listening, if there's ever a time that you all want to play really well and actually get a win, it would be this week. So do with that what you will, but I'm probably going to lose. So, yeah. And last but not least, Cody, how would you like to end things off? Yeah, man, it was a good week. Uh, I'm glad I got the win. Uh, going to play Bra this next week, mentally trying to prepare for that. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if I can kind of play his game a little bit and uh, come out with a win. 
Uh, one thing I want to mention here, um, we've all kind of talked about it on all, this is the ninth podcast we've done now. We've all kind of mentioned, you know, uh, the beach dogs and the tar ponds, um, how unlucky they've been. The beach dogs are four and five. The tar ponds are five and four. They are first and second, respectively, in points against. One thing I want to mention while I was, I was looking at that that's super interesting to me is the team fourth in points against is the 9-0 and yard goats. So if, if 9-0 and isn't impressive enough, if leading the league and scoring isn't impressive enough, John Height, you've had the fourth most points scored against you out of any team in this league and you're nine and zero. So just giving you some credit for you. for really strong. Uh, I'm going to try to beat the shit out of you in two uh-huh. weeks. We'll see what happens. Um, it's going to be fun, man. It's it's going to be fun. I, I hope that you are ten and zero and I'm nine and one. When we have that matchup, we will see what happens. But yeah, not trying to look ahead. I've got a very very tough opponent uh, this week. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I think that Connor mentioned. How, you know, the deadline's kind of looming around. Uh, teams are kind of jockeying for position here. Uh, for me, I still think we're kind of set with one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you know, honestly, looking around, I think Paul is probably kind of locked in uh, being a six or seven seed in the playoffs. Um, you know, with. But but there's a lot of teams bundled up there, you know. We've got a five three and one team, two five and four teams, two four and five teams, and three three and six teams. So I mean that one two three four five six seven half the league is within, you know, a game and a half of each other, two two and a half games with each other. So uh, ten more weeks to the regular season. Uh, if you're sitting there in that middle pack, five and four four and five, three and six, and you're not making moves right now, uh, you're probably at that. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of what happens. Uh, I'm looking forward to this week. Well, thank you for the shout-out, Cody. I have noticed, I obviously, I checked the, the points for a lot. Me and you have been neck and neck. I think I'm at 7,200. You're at 7,100. So I think every week it might change with who's the most points for. But I actually, I, I noticed, I think, two weeks ago about the points against, um, just because I've had some a lot of tough opponents. I had, I've had i had Tita, I've had Hen twice, I've had Jamie, um, I've had Bry. So I think I've had all the, the quote-unquote top teams of the league right now, except for you, which I'm dreading heavily in, in, in about two weeks. Should be fun. I can't wait to see what the betting odds for that one's going to be. It should be a lot of fun. But for me... Um, I've been circling this one on my calendar since the season began. Uh, Bracton talks a lot of raw about my team, about how old it is, and that's fine. Old people win games. They don't lose games, so I'm hoping they win again, um, even if they might be close to dying soon, according to him. So let's see what happens. Should be a fun week regardless. Again, league's in a great spot. Everyone's doing a really good job. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more trades this week than the, the, the past week. I think we're at this point of the season that someone mentioned before that uh, we think that people really know what's going on with their teams. So the directions are going to be pretty set going forward as the deadline gets closer. So it will be a fun week. But that'll do it for this edition of the Base on Balls podcast. Big thank you to N, Connor, Paul, Bracken, Cody, and, of course, Tita. I've been John Height. We'll be back next week for a nice recap of Week 10, I'll say, is the next one. Er, yes, week yeah. ten. Yes, week ten is next one. Sorry, my bad. So that should be a fun time. And for now, take care and have a great rest of your day.